Todd Vandermeid, thanks for joining us on the Illinois channel. And today we are going to talk, uh, fortunately, about something besides the uh, coronavirus. The Illinois Supreme Court issued a ruling as we sit here this morning on what was known as the Brown case out of White County, Illinois. And it concerns the Foyd card. Uh, the lower court had issued a ruling saying that was unconstitutional. Now the Illinois Supreme Court issued their ruling. And if you could give us, uh, what, what is the background as you and your lawyers uh, read the case? Well, today it was kind of a split decision by the court, both with a divided bench, but they vacated the unconstitutional finding for the criminal case and remanded it back to the lower court, claiming that there was no record for them to make a decision upon. So it's very interesting that they didn't find the Foy Card Act constitutional, they didn't find it unconstitutional. They just said that the judge's ruling didn't comport with Supreme Court rules. So they remanded it back to the lower court in Whiteside County, uh, or White County, I mean. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting, but the fact that the Illinois Supreme Court did not come out on a decision and validate the constitutionality of the Foyd card speaks volumes. Uh, it wasn't unconstitutional. It just didn't have, you say, enough evidentiary evidence. Did they indicate or suggest what, what they would have wanted to have seen uh, to, to actually rule whether it was or was not constitutional? It, there was a couple of paragraphs in the decision talking about the lack of a record. Um, in a very strongly worded dissent from Justice Carmeier and Justice Thies, uh, they said there was ample evidence in the record and that this uh, rule citing uh, seems to be a novel way for them to simply dump the case. Uh, you know, what we know for a fact is the woman had no criminal history. We know that the law enforcement agency was called there. We know that they found her to be in possession of a 22 caliber rifle in her own home. Uh, and she didn't have a FOIA card again. So it would seeing that all the factual basis for the judge's original finding are there and present, but the court took this novel approach to not having to decide the case. Um, but I would think that this should give lawmakers in Springfield uh, and others great pause that you just had the highest court in the state of Illinois refuse to declare the Floyd card constitutional. So what happens now? Uh, if if you right now it's just status quo. We go on with the Floyd card. Uh, will the lower court then uh, have a, a dif different hearing or an additional hearing to get some evidentiary evidence so that then the Supreme Court can make a uh, determination of constitutionality? Not being a lawyer, this is where I'm at a bit of a disadvantage <laughs> on the procedures of the court. Uh, however, it would seem that based on the court's instructions on a vacate and remand that the trial court will get another bite at the apple to deal with this issue. How they deal with that issue remains to be seen. Um, but there is another case that is pending in uh, a different district um, challenging the constitutionality of the Floyd card on its face. This was an as-applied challenge meaning that as the circumstances of this individual's criminal conduct or criminal allegations, that uh, how did the facts and circumstances for this one person did the statute, you know, comport? Um, the case coming out of, I believe it's the uh, fourth district, is one that is just an outright facial challenge that the Floyd Card Act is unconstitutional. Uh, that. You know, that one uh, is going to be up in front of a remand to the trial court after the state Supreme Court that I insert on it last week. So uh, it'll be back in front of the lower court, and this case would appear to give us a roadmap. The uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, a U.S. Constitution, I should say, is the Second Amendment, as virtually everyone would know, um, has said that uh, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, many people, including yourself and others, uh, have said that obviously the Foyd card is an infringement, that you have to be licensed to have access to uh, a constitutional right. 
speak of your word on while the court didn't necessarily address that directly let's let's talk a little bit about that aspect of it from the perspective of who you represent the federal firearms licensees well here's where we get to swerve into the coronavirus so let's look at what's going on presently so at the onset of this a couple weeks ago the state police were flooded with background checks they received 35,000 background checks in a week. Now, if you normally consider that state police deal with about 200,000 background checks a year for firearm purchases, they saw over 17% of, of a year's work, more than a month's work, sat there and was compressed into a week. And so, Background checks are running eight days, nine days today in order for people to get approved to purchase their firearm. Background checks have now turned into a delay and a denial of a, con of a fundamental constitutional right. Look at the FOID card. The FOID card act, they, were, they had 30 calendar days to process FOIDs. They've now been given 60 business days through a change in the statute a couple years ago, and they still cannot meet their statutory obligation. So you go from 30 calendar days to get your pre-approved card to permit to own and possess or purchase a firearm to 12 weeks. How, you know, is there any, you know, a federal court just struck down the prohibition on abortions as elective surgery uh, in Texas because it's a denial of a right. How is denying the right to or the ability to run out and get a firearm because you think you're going to need it in times of social unrest not a denial of a fundamental right? We currently have law enforcement agencies who have no contact orders. We have law enforcement agencies who are only uh, responding to the most dire and violent uh, of calls on 911. You have a criminal justice system that is playing catch and release with you know, with career criminals. We're seeing people released from jails, and they're reoffending relatively quickly. We just saw a uh, group of individuals mug and accost a CTA bus driver, forcing the the bus to crash. And yet, you know, how is all of this taking place around us? You know, people are turning to firearms ownership, wanting to make sure that they have the means and ability to defend themselves if this whole system comes crashing down. And denying that for eight days for a background check or for now 12 weeks in order to just have the ability to buy a firearm. How is that not an infringement? How is that not the deprivation of a fundamental constitutional right? Todd, let me bring up a... Uh graphic here and it says the uh, the circuit court's ruling this is from today's supreme court ruling it reads uh, the circuit court's ruling that section 2a paragraph 1 of the foid card act is unconstitutional as applied was not necessary to the resolution of this case but uh, as you had pointed out earlier your contention or that of the lawyers uh, that you've referred to said uh, that this is not throwing out the Brown case, but just says that it is uh, something that has to have more evidence. And you said earlier in the conversation that you think maybe this means the Floyd card is now on, um, uh, what, what, what was the term you on? In life support. Life support, right. Uh, I was going to say ICU. Um, so it's on life support. Is your expectation, uh, first of all, do you, did you, any of the lawyers you consulted with, did they give you any idea of how long uh, it might take for the lower court to go through their process before the Supreme Court might take this up again? I'd have to look at uh, the original timeline. Um, when this was filed because I you know I think this court case has been going on since 18 so you know we're two years in the making to get here this case was argued last December late November so it took the court 120 days over the holiday to issue this ruling um, not sure it, it all depends I mean understand that our court system is slowed down uh, with this pandemic that's going on where appellate courts are not holding oral arguments, things have put in abeyance for a lot of things. So, 
it, it kind of depends on how fast things get back to quasi normal with this pandemic. Uh, but I think it is going to throw more gasoline on the fire because the court did not come out and specifically say this is a reasonable regulation. This comports with the Heller decision. This, you know, this is okay. That the, that the Floyd card is constitutional. They said the court did, the trial court didn't give them enough evidence and they didn't have to get to that decision making process. Um, I, I, I think that that decision is going to be coming forward here if I had to put a timeline on it, depending on how fast some trial courts and or the appellate courts deal with, I think we're going to have that decision in the next two years. I think that if a local court again finds the statute unconstitutional, then I think that is going to be on a direct appeal from the Attorney General's office to the state Supreme Court again. Now, we will have, we have a new justice up there, Burke, who replaces Justice Thomas. Uh, Justice Neville has been retained uh, in the primary in Cook County, so he will be back. Uh, but Justice Carmeier is leaving the court. He's not seeking re-election. So we'll have a new justice out of the 5th District. Uh, it all depends on how fast a court case can get up there. Do Is there a local court that finds the Floyd Card Act unconstitutional this spring that sets up a fall argument hearing, if possible? It all depends on how fast the lower courts go. As we um, as we sit here, and you were mentioning about the uh, violence that's taken taken up, and uh, as you say, the coronavirus, where everyone now is at home and people are hoarding toilet paper, it's not hard to imagine that there might be some uh, violence or people breaking into homes seeking either food or any number of other things. And you would argue that's exactly why people want to be able to have a the right to go out and buy a a firearm and no one saw this coming and so and it's an example of where maybe you want to be able to go out on a moment's notice and buy a firearm to defend your family the uh, the FOID card has to go through the uh, processes of the bureaucracy and it's handled as I understand it by the uh, Illinois State Police um, how well have they been uh, doing in in handling the FOID card uh, historically and they would also argue that they need more money to uh, have the resources to do the background checks and all that the FOID card process uh, demands. So what, what do you say uh, along the FOID card process? Well, the state police are charged with handling the FOID card and concealed carry applications and the background checks on the retail purchases. Uh, what has come to light is that they have not been funded to the appropriate levels that $30 million of funding for the FOID card has been swept away and used for general operations within the government. So they haven't paid and staffed up the Firearm Services Bureau within FOID or within the state police in order to process these. They So you, you have this dereliction of duty on behalf of the government that, you know, they are not staffing this department sufficiently in order to accommodate the workload. Then you have them sweeping funds away from this department, which further impairs their ability to hire bodies, uh, you know, bring in even temporary workers when you have an influx or anything like that. So there's been this real dereliction of duty on behalf of the Illinois state government and even this administration is to not correct this. I mean, we've had an administration that's been here for a year. One of the first things the governor did was sign an act to regulate gun shops. Yet, we still don't have a single certified gun shop in the state of Illinois because they haven't been able to get the rules together. Now you sit there and it just compounds that you can't get a FOID card renewed in the timeline that they've been given by the statute. They can't process background checks in the timeline given by the statute. And so I don't know that it's as much blame to place on the state police as it is on the overall government as to they're not making this a priority. And then to turn around and say that we now need more funding and you want to nick gun owners 
for the state mandated intrusion into a fundamental constitutional right is just appalling. The funny thing is you have all these first timers running to gun stores right now wanting to obtain a firearm for self-defense. You know, being an FFL, I can tell you I look at the distributor websites daily. There is a distributor out there that has a self-defense shotgun available for sale to retailers right now. They don't want uh, handguns. There's been a run on handguns. Those are the two largest. And a lot of these people who are buying guns aren't the people who feared a gun ban, who thought that they were never going to be able to get an AR-15 or other semi-auto. These are people who are first-time buyers a lot of times that we are seeing coming into the stores. And they're, some of them, they walk in and they say, I want to buy a handgun. Okay, let me see your FOID card. What's a FOID card? So I think that uh, one of the side effects of this whole pandemic is going to be the education that the gun show loophole doesn't exist, that you just can't buy a gun over the Internet, no questions asked. You can't walk into a gun store, plunk down a lot, uh, wad of cash, and walk out with a handgun or a rifle or a shotgun. That does not exist, especially in this state. And so I think a lot of the malarkey or the BS that the anti-gunners have been propagating in their anti-gun bumper sticker slogan mentality is now being shown for the outright bald-faced lies that it is. And I think a lot of people are becoming educated that what it takes just to own a gun in the state of Illinois. And I think this pandemic and the, you know, the feeling, the need that people think they need to run out and have a firearm because they don't think the cops are going to be there to protect them or the cops are simply going to show up after the fact to draw an outline around a body is going to make its way into several court briefs uh, about just how intrusive the whole legislature will come back into session. They have to pass a budget. It might be that we have nothing more happen this year than them passing a budget. And as the governor said yesterday, he's going to have to tear up all the projections of revenues they had before and, and put together a new budget based upon the realities of today. So uh, maybe something like the 1966, SB 1966 never gets considered. And if it doesn't come up in the, even in the fall, uh, then it would die as a new legislature comes in, in in January. But why don't you give us your thoughts on what that would, uh, on what that would do uh, and how that all fits in together with what we now are looking at from the ruling on the Supreme Court. Well, first off, I think 1966 is on life support. Even with a supermajority of 40 Democrats in the Illinois Senate, they have not been able to round up the necessary votes to pass that. So uh, I think my read on what's gone on with the uh, uh, with that legislation is the House acted in a moment of haste uh, based on the Aurora shooting, and cooler heads have prevailed, and now... Um, obviously, we were in for a few weeks earlier this year, and there was very little movement on that bill at all. There hasn't even been a hearing on it at the Senate. Uh, I think that I'm relishing when we get an opportunity to sit down at a committee table and have the discussion about how effective 1966 or any other piece of legislation like that would be, considering eight, nine days to get an F-tip or a background check approved on the purchase, that the state police is running 12 weeks behind, that they have swept $30 million out of the funds, and yet they're trying to hold their hand out to pick the pocket of gun owners claiming they need more funding. That's absolute BS. Uh, so then you pile in. It, what's really been funny is there was a bill filed in Congress, 5717, back in January, and it now has garnered a bunch of attention by gun rights people because Hank Johnson, the congressman who in, infamously is quoted for thinking Guam might tip over um, because of some U.S. naval exercises, uh, filed this ungodly piece of legislation. Uh, I've not heard any other talk of gun control um, since this pandemic and since the start of the governor's lockdown order uh, a couple weeks ago. I, you know, you don't see it. Uh, you see some from the anti-gun groups 
uh, woeing and wringing their hands and bemoaning the fact that gun shops are deemed essential in a lot of states that are being left open, that there have been court challenges to several, and in those cases, uh, most municipalities and states have backed down. The governor of New Jersey has flip-flopped. The governor of Pennsylvania has flip-flopped. Uh, we do need to, you know, give an attaboy to Governor Pritzker that he deemed the firearms industry uh, essential and did not shut down uh, gun stores, retailers, manufacturers. Uh, so I think that uh, what's really deafening is the absolute silence overall of the gun control movement when it comes to any other proposals. That, that there's nothing coming out of the typical gun grabbers out of Springfield. They are all very, very quiet. Um, and I think it's going to be hard pressed on them to justify anything. One, if the Illinois Supreme Court today did not say the Floyd Card Act in its barest of forms, as is today, is constitutional, how can they find Senate Bill 1966, if it were to pass at some point in time, constitutional? And I think before 1966 gets anywhere close to the governor's office, we may have another ruling from the Illinois Supreme Court. We won't keep you much longer, but uh, how many uh, states in the United States have a FOID card or a similar legislation? Sure. Illinois is one of four states that have anything like this. You've got Maryland, New Jersey, Illinois, and then Massachusetts has something. But basically, if you can own a handgun in Massachusetts, you can carry a handgun. So um, we're in the vast minority of this. And let's point out something as to how useless the FOIA card really is, Terry. If you're, in a, if you're a resident of Indiana, you can come over to an Illinois gun shop and purchase an AR-15. Pass the background check, fill out the paperwork, and then once uh, you, you comply with the waiting period, all that, you can take it home. They don't have a FOIA card. They simply have a driver's license. Same goes for a resident of Wisconsin, Missouri, Kentucky, uh, other states. So, so they don't, if they're buying in Illinois, they don't have to have a FOIA card? Nope. They can, federal law allows them to buy long guns across state lines, and they do not have to have a FOIA card in order to make a purchase. They run a background check based on their driver's license. But yet, you or I cannot go into that same gun store and buy the same AR-15 without having to have this pre-approved state card to which they then run us through another background check at the point of sale. So you can't convince me that the FOIA card is all that useful to begin with. How uh, how expensive is it to get a FOID card, and what is typical? What's the typical wait period? And actually, as I say this, we recently uh, had a, a press conference on the Illinois Channel when a former state's attorney, I forget the county he was state's attorney in, over in the eastern portion of uh, the state, uh, was saying how I think he's been waiting since last July for his application to go through, and here was a state's attorney. So. He goes, you know, I don't want to violate the law. It was my whole career to enforce the law. But he was complaining that, you know, here he is waiting now nearly uh, nine months, and still he doesn't have the FOID card. There are some of those out there. Uh, right now, typically, it's running more than 12 weeks in order to get a renewal process. I'm in the middle of the renewal process. My FOID card expires in May. Uh, I filed for my renewal over a month ago, uh, sometime back in February, if I remember correctly. So I'm waiting to see when I'm going to get my FOIA card. Uh, and as uh, the owner of a small gun store, uh, it distresses me that I might have an expired card with my federal firearms license. Uh, but, you know, this is what it is. It's, uh, you know, the system doesn't work. The system is flawed. No fault of the state police. It's just you have this bureaucratic nightmare. I mean, it's just like, you know, they don't have, they can't get enough masks or didn't have the pre-deployed supplies. They can't get masks to the frontline workers in this pandemic, yet somehow they're supposed to keep tabs on 2.3 million gun owners in the state of Illinois and process all that information. It doesn't work. I think there's more efficient ways to spend 
money within state government than through the FOIA card? Uh, you know, one of the things, and well, maybe this is unfair to ask of you, but maybe if you want to opine on it, you know, about a year ago, just almost exactly a year ago, we had the IGOL, the Illinois Gun Owners uh, ID uh, March. Uh, thousands turn out for that. And when the Illinois Channel covered that and put it up on YouTube, I will share that we had comments from around the world of people saying we wish we had the Second Amendment here in England and in other countries uh, where gun ownership is more restricted. Uh, iGold was canceled this year, as so many other events were. What in general, your, your gut feel, and you, you talked about it a little bit, but uh, I, I take it you think this whole pandemic uh, and the impact and the awareness of how society can change on a dime is probably going to put the wind at your sails or, or help the whole argument of the right to keep and bear arms in the United States. Would I be right on that? Oh, I, th I think it's definitely going to help. I think it certainly points out the shortcomings and the flaws within the system. I think that we have a chance to have a whole new um, I don't know if generation is the right word, but a whole new set of gun owners who bought into the anti-gun BS that you could just plunk down cash, walk in and walk out with a gun. You know, that, that a somehow Amazon dropped these off at your doorsteps if you made a few clicks with a mouse. It doesn't work that way. So I think that a bunch of these people have been awakened for the outright lies that have been spewed by editorial pages and the anti-gun movement in the whole. So if they, it depends. I mean, right now we've got, what, four more weeks of this, you know, shelter in place, um, restricted travel kind of uh, order from our governor. Virginia, they've extended it out to June 10th. Uh, we'll see what else happens. But I think as this goes on, and now you're seeing police departments uh, Chicago's had what several hundred officers who have been quarantined and or affected by this pandemic you've got potentially 15 to 20 percent of New York City's police department who have been taken out of service by this uh, I think it depends on how much longer this all goes and what the and what the outcome is I think we are all hoping for the best so far social social norms have been observed we haven't seen any real spikes uh, in crime or anything like that, but um, you know they're boarding up stores on Michigan Avenue for a reason, and it's not because a hurricane is coming. Todd, you uh, before we close out, the other unusual thing about what has already been a very unusual year is that this is a presidential election year, and we have at the time no ability to go out and have rallies. Do you think uh, is this going to be much of an issue in your estimation, uh, either in the presidential election or on any of the uh, state ballot issues? I think it could be. I think it remains to be seen as to what kind of things get buried within stimulus packages and other things that um, affect how we vote. Uh, there was some talk uh, across social media and other stuff with this last uh, stimulus bill about things that were trying to be included in there. I think part of it, you know, contends on how well the uh, president handles the overall situation. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently that while uh, the House was impeaching the president, he was sitting in meetings uh, with a task force formulating uh, how to handle the pandemic, or what we what we thought was an outbreak of a flu in the beginning. Um, this has certainly changed the dynamic. I think this is going to be altering to the social fabric of our country in a number of ways and voting is just going to be one part of it as to whether or not we go to we already have some vote by mail but we do do we do an entire election like that um, do we do something where there's voting across the internet um, there have been systematic changes that we you and i have been witnessing in springfield even though it's not uh, the area i operate in um, but we'll see i mean what happens if a bunch of people decide that you know uh, you know, it, it may be fashionable to run on gun control in Lincoln Park. I don't know how much, how fashionable that's going to be in some of these other areas when, you know, people, uh, I mean, we, you know, you've seen a run on toilet paper. 
I still don't understand that one. You've seen a, a run on some other staples, but we have seen a run on guns and a run on ammunition to where we've watched ammunition prices virtually double in the last two weeks. You, you know, I, I, I keep having one last question, uh, but uh, we'll make this one the last one. We have, we, we in the past, had uh, gun manufacturers in Illinois, uh, I think over on the western part of the state, there were a number of them. What, what has happened to those? Is, does Illinois still have a gun manufacturing found base or have we driven them out of the state? Well, things like the dealer licensing and other things have been driving them out. The political climate of Illinois has been forcing them to move elsewhere. We've seen um, Les Bear moved over to Iowa. You've got Lewis Machine and Tool, who's in the middle of a transition to Iowa. You've had other um, other manufacturers looking to move and investigate moves to Missouri. We have states around us trying to poach those manufacturing industries constantly. Um, you know, for the guys that are in the Quad City, if they move across the river, they can still maintain their workforce, which is a significant, you know, uh, proposition for them. Uh, we'll see. We still have some. Uh, we are down 50% of FFLs since uh, the legislature passed the gun dealer licensing law. Um, so, you know, there, there are fewer FFLs in the state to go around. And we are losing manufacturing jobs to other states because of the climate here. Mm -hmm. Well, Todd Benjamin, we appreciate you joining us and uh, sharing your thoughts on this uh, ruling. Uh, we'll obviously follow it. Uh, as we have over the years, all these uh, gun issues, you've always been one of the most informed people on that issue, and thank you for taking the time with us today. Anytime, Terry. Glad to be with you. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment.